is EM Cases EM Quick Hits Podcast. Quick, let's get on with it. EM Cases is part of SHREMI, the Schwartz Reisman Emergency Medicine Institute. That's the nonprofit organization dedicated to improving EM care through high quality research and education. The opinions expressed on this podcast are intended for general information and educational purposes only and should not be used to diagnose, treat, or prevent any medical condition, nor should they be used as a substitute for medical advice from a qualified practicing physician. Unless stated otherwise, the opinions expressed by the hosts or guests are made in their individual capacity, not on behalf of the Institute nor Medicine Cases. IV fluid boluses. There was a time when the IV fluid bolus was central to emergency medicine. More important than ketamine or pocus or even ceftriaxone, it's possible that normal saline, one liter IV bolus, is the most common order written in all of emergency medicine history. But over the last decade, we've heard more and more about the harms of IV fluids. Or if they aren't harmful, at least they don't seem to be doing what we hoped. Sepsis is where we've seen the most research, and we have dramatically scaled back our use of IV fluids when you compare the current practice to the Manny Rivers era. But what about other conditions? Well, pancreatitis is actually a lot like sepsis. There isn't necessarily a fluid deficit, but systemic inflammation can cause massive third spacing and intravascular fluid deficits. So for a long time, IV fluids have been central to pancreatitis management. But there's a big paper this year the Waterfall Study, published in the New England Journal of Medicine, a randomized trial comparing aggressive IV fluids to moderate IV fluids in patients with mild to moderate pancreatitis. Everybody received Ringer's lactate in this trial. The aggressive group received a 20 milliliter per kilogram bolus, followed by 3 mils per kg per hour. So that's like a 1.5 liter bolus and then 175 mils an hour, which doesn't sound that aggressive to me, at least as compared to when I started training, but it's a reasonable fluid order. In the moderate group, they only received a bolus if they were hypovolemic, and then that bolus was smaller at 10 mils per kilogram. And then everybody got a rate of 1.5 mils per kilogram per hour, which does sound smaller. So that would be something like a 800 milliliter bolus if needed, and then 120 mils an hour. The trial was stopped early after enrolling 249 patients because an interim analysis suggested harm in the form of increased fluid overload in the aggressive group. Their primary outcome was the development of severe pancreatitis, and that occurred in 22% of the aggressive group and 17% of the moderate group. So that isn't statistically significant, but the numbers definitely look better with less fluid. Fluid overload happened in 20% of the aggressive group and only 6% of the moderate group. Now, of course, fluid overload is a surrogate outcome, but important outcomes also look worse with the aggressive approach. For example, respiratory failure was 7% as compared to 2%, but not statistically significant. So the very simple answer from this trial, once again, is it seems like less is more when it comes to IV fluids. Very few of our patients, unless you're working on a cholera ward, have a deficit of salt water, whatever mixture of salt water you happen to like the most. How certain should we be about this results? Well, there are definitely some limitations here. This is an open label trial and it was stopped early. So there is definitely going to be a risk of bias. However, This data fits with everything else we've seen about IV fluid management. So our pretest probability should be much higher in this trial than it would be for a brand new drug, something like Paxlovid. It shouldn't take much to convince us that less IV fluids is the better option for our patients. So in that context, this data, despite significant limitations, probably should be enough to change practice. Except there's one big problem to think about. I don't know that this trial included the right patients. They were looking at mild pancreatitis. Do those patients need IV fluids at all? There's been data recently on getting pancreatitis patients back on oral intake as soon as possible. So personally, my practice with mild pancreatitis is to get their pain under control and their nausea under control and then get them drinking as soon as possible as their source of hydration. So for my practice, I don't know if these results are all that applicable. Bottom line, if your practice is to routinely use IV fluids in pancreatitis, this trial suggests that less is more. Keep your boluses small. This trial used 10 mils per kilogram. I might go even smaller than that. 500 mils is a nice standard bolus that won't throw off my nurses, so I might order 500 at a time and then reassess the patient in between.
My big question is whether this trial went far enough. Do patients with mild pancreatitis need any IV fluids at all? This paper doesn't answer that. But my practice for years has been a lot more sparing with the IV and to get patients drinking as soon as possible in the emergency department. But I guess that's for a future podcast. That was, of course, Dr. Justin Morgenstern, who I think brought up a great point to think about before we all start giving tiny boluses to all patients with pancreatitis. And that is that this 10 milliliter per kilogram bolus of fluid only applies to patients with mild pancreatitis. So before we abandon giving lots of fluids to patients with pancreatitis altogether, think about whether your patient fits the inclusion criteria of the waterfall study. And let's look out for some trials that compare no IV fluids with small IV boluses and large IV boluses in both patients with mild and severe pancreatitis. All right, next up, we have EMK's go-to ENT educator, Dr. Lior Summer. Now, he's going to be featured in some professionally produced procedural videos at the upcoming EM Cases Summit that I'm very psyched for. Tickets are on sale, by the way, at emcasessummit.com. And in this EM Cases Quick Hit, he's going to talk about identification and management of nasal fractures in the ED. Now, I asked him to do this segment after I listened to a segment on nasal fractures on the amazing MRAP, which didn't seem to quite jibe with what my clinical experience is. So I asked Dr. Summer to clarify some things. Take it away, Dr. Summer. Hi there. Lior Summer here, your local community emergency physician, with a quick word on nasal fractures. I've seen a huge degree of variability in the diagnosis and treatment of nasal fractures by emergency medicine providers over my 20 years of practice. And I think this really reflects on the absence of training on this particular topic and on the emergency treatment of ENT diagnoses during emergency medicine training. I'd like to make a small effort to rectify that a bit by giving you my take on the diagnosis and treatment of nasal fractures in the emergency department. Now, fair warning, there aren't great studies on this topic, but there are a few reviews, but unfortunately, this is largely an evidence-free zone of medicine. So that warning aside, let's talk about diagnosis. Now, given the way the nose sticks out of the face and mine sticks out quite a bit, Most nasal fractures are isolated injuries, but obviously not always. So we have to be aware and to clinically check for other associated injuries, like other more significant facial fractures, C-spine injuries, head injuries, or the often associated Friday night hand injuries. If you suspect a more complex facial trauma, then obviously imaging, most often in the form of a CT scan, is indicated. Also, if there's a significant laceration over an obvious nasal fracture, this should be considered an open fracture and managed with appropriate antibiotic prophylaxis and consultation with your local specialist, depending on your institution. But let's stick to simple, isolated nasal fractures. For the overwhelming majority of these, there is no indication for imaging. The utility of nasal x-rays in the clinical care of nasal fractures is zero. There are a few reasons for this. First of all, a non-displaced, non-clinically apparent nasal fracture really needs no active emergency treatment other than ice, analgesia, and elevation. This would be identical care for a nasal contusion. So the diagnosis of an undisplaced nasal fracture is pointless. It changes nothing. Also, remember that the nose has a large cartilaginous component. It's mostly cartilage. So a fracture through the cartilage with a huge deviation is still very clinically relevant and significant, but it wouldn't show up on a plain film of the nose. So again, nasal x-rays would offer no value to these patients. So just to drive the point home, nasal x-rays are useless. Please don't order nasal x-rays to rule out a nasal fractures. The patients don't need them. In the setting of an isolated nasal fracture, a CT scan in the emergency department is rarely, if ever, indicated. In a patient who's going to undergo an open reduction, there might be a role for CT to guide surgical management, but honestly, I would leave this in the hands of the specialist who may or may not need it. There was a recent epidemiological study released in January of this year, and it found that the health care expenditures for nasal fractures have gone up about 75% in the United States in the past eight years. 
This despite no increase in treatment or length of stay in hospital. Almost all the increased cost was due to imaging, and almost all of that was CT scanning. From my perspective, in the emergency department setting, the best test for a clinically relevant nasal fracture is inspection by an emergency provider. And some tips for making the diagnosis. Number one, always remember to assess for the dreaded complication of nasal fractures, the septal hematoma. Remember, the nasal cartilage is dependent on nasal mucosa for its nutrient supply. And if you separate that with a septal hematoma and it goes undiagnosed and untreated, it could result in nasal septal cartilage necrosis and a big cosmetic deformity and possible nasal perforation or septal perforation. This is really a can't-miss diagnosis. And if you see one, it needs emergent evacuation and usually packing to adhere the mucosa back onto the nasal septum and reduce the chance of recurrence. Second tip, assess the patient from two planes. And obviously you're going to look at the patient face-to-face, head-on, remember to take their masks off. But also, I find it very useful to look at their nose from above. The easiest way to do this is have the patient sit down and go behind the patient, have them tilt their head up, and then look down over their forehead, over the bridge of their nose to the tip of their nose. And this kind of allows you to see the subtle nasal deviation that may or may not be there. Finally, ask the patient and the people who they came with to assess for the deformity too. They are obviously going to know the person's face better than you. And this can be done with a mirror or with the always available selfie camera on a smartphone. The last thing you want to do is try to correct a pre-existing nasal deviation. So let's go on to treatment. And I have to admit, I love doing procedures in the emergency department. It's one of the reasons I love emergency medicine. And people ask me why I bother reducing nasal fractures in the ED. Isn't it easier to just send them to ENT or OMFS or plastics or whoever deals with them at your hospital? They can be reduced as an outpatient in a few days or a week. The thing is, the same can be said of most minimally or moderately displaced long bone fractures too, like say a distal radius fracture. Most of us wouldn't leave a moderately displaced colleys fracture unreduced and have them follow up in a week when the swelling comes down. Most of us reduce these, and even if the patient may need a subsequent reduction or other procedure, we still reduce them. And for me, the same holds for nasal fractures. And there are a few reasons for this. First off, it's well within our skill set to reduce these fractures. We reduce lots of bone fractures and dislocations in the emergency department setting, and noses are no different. They're actually easier in some ways. Also, we have the advantage of seeing these patients before a significant amount of swelling sets in, distorting their anatomic landmarks, so we can easily assess and reduce them early. Most of us have the skills to employ regional anesthesia in helping at these procedures. Usually, For me, this means an infraorbital nerve block and an external nasal nerve block, and these are easy to do. Now, some patients may opt for or need procedural sedation for this procedure, and again, we have all the right facilities and personnel to make this happen in the emergency department. I also think that patients are much happier and more satisfied leaving the emergency department with their noses midline, facing forward rather than pointing east or west. And I know that if I were to break my nose, I would rather have it reduced early rather than walk around for 10 or 14 days with it deviated. Finally, in many centers, timely outpatient follow-up is a challenge. So leaving these unreduced and hoping that specialty care happens in a timely manner can leave patients in a lurch. If these patients have their fractures adequately reduced in the emergency department, there is less likelihood that they'll need outpatient procedures. That being said, I do always arrange for outpatient follow-up to ensure that the patients are happy with the cosmesis when the swelling and bruising settles down. So that's it. That's my rant on nasal fractures. My big take-home points are don't order nasal x-rays for isolated nasal fractures and don't be afraid to reduce a simple nasal fracture in the emergency department. Thanks again to Emergency Medicine Cases for having me on the podcast. Love it. I can hear another Lior Summer podcast on the procedure of nasal fracture reduction tips and tricks, pearls and pitfalls. For now, we'll get some images and hopefully a video of the procedure for you in the show notes.
Next up, we have our geriatric EM expert, Dr. Christina Shenvey, who's going to lay out the first part of a two-part quick hit on acute delirium. So common, yet so often challenging in the eMERGE. Delirium. How can you identify, assess, and evaluate patients with delirium? I'm Christina Shenvey. If you haven't diagnosed delirium recently, there's unfortunately a good chance you may have missed it because 7 to 10% of all older adults in the ED have delirium. So it's worth thinking about a little more. First, delirium should be thought of as acute brain dysfunction. It's not just something that all older patients get with time. It's acute brain dysfunction. It has three key components. The first one is a waxing and waning altered mental status. The second is inattention. Inattention is the sine qua non of delirium. So pay attention to inattention. The third component is an altered level of consciousness or disorganized thinking. If a patient has those features, there's a good chance that they have delirium. I mentioned that it's present in about 7 to 10% of older ED patients, but it's missed up to 75% of the time. And when we miss it in the ED, they're more likely to miss it on admission as well. Delirium comes in three subtypes. The first is hyperactive delirium. This is less common and you're probably not going to miss it. Those are the patients who are crawling out of bed, who are pulling out their IVs, who the nurses are constantly asking you for help with. Hyperactive delirium. You're not going to miss that. The second is hypoactive delirium. This one is much more common, about 92% of cases of delirium, and it's easy to miss. These are the patients who appear to be laying or sleeping quietly in their bed. They're not pulling out their IVs. They're just laying there comfortably. And maybe your patient is just laying there comfortably, but maybe they're delirious. Hypoactive delirium is more often missed and is more often associated with worse outcomes. So when we look at patients in the ED, there are certain features that we know will increase their risk for delirium. And the three that come out from the research are cognitive impairment, difficulty with their activities of daily living, or ADLs, and hearing impairment. In fact, if you have none of those things, so you can do your ADLs, you don't have cognitive impairment, and you don't have hearing difficulties, the percentage of older ED patients with delirium who have none of those three is less than 1%. Whereas as you add in those risk factors, the risk of delirium increases. In fact, if you have all three, which is not that uncommon, hearing impairment, difficulty with ADLs, and cognitive decline, your risk of having delirium in the ED goes up to almost 50%. So next time you have a patient with cognitive impairment or with functional decline or with hearing impairment, a little bell should go off in the back of your head that says, hey, this is a risk factor for delirium. Maybe I should do something to assess whether this patient has delirium. That brings us to how do you diagnose delirium? Well, the bad news is we are not good at just telling if someone has delirium. That requires us to keep it in the forefront of our minds and requires us to really do an assessment. The good news is there are great screening tools out there that can detect delirium. The idea with a screening tool is that you have to apply it to everyone to find those occult cases that you might otherwise miss. There are different systems and mechanisms out there, but a commonly used one is the combination of a delirium triage screen and a brief confusion assessment method. The delirium triage screen can quickly be done in triage. It looks for, is there altered level of consciousness or inattention? Remember, pay attention to inattention. If that's positive, it's pretty sensitive, 98% sensitive for delirium, but it's not that specific. So then you can combine it with the second method, which is the brief confusion assessment method that is more specific, 97% specific for delirium. And the brief confusion assessment method, or BCAM, consists of those three components of delirium. Does the patient have an altered mental status or fluctuating course? Do they have inattention? And third, do they have an altered level of consciousness or disorganized thinking? 
And if those are true, then the patient has delirium. And remember, inattention is the key feature to watch for. Let's say now you have been thinking about delirium, you've been looking for those risk factors, you don't want to miss it, and you've instituted a screening method for finding those patients with delirium. Well, now, what should you do? Well, you can target your workup to some of the more common causes of delirium. Sometimes it may be obvious, but other times it can be hard to tell. The patient comes in confused or weak and dizzy or altered mental status or some other nondescript failure to thrive like symptoms. What should you do? Well, target your workup to the most common causes of delirium. Those are things like, one, medications. Have they started a new medication? Things like anticholinergics or antihistamines, muscle relaxants, antipsychotics, some sort of sedative, or even steroids. Polypharmacy itself, meaning four or more medications, can also increase your risk of delirium. So first, look at their medications and ask about any recent changes. Second, look for infections. Think about your pulmonary, your UTI, intra-abdominal, meningitis, encephalitis, or skin infections. Patients who are wheelchair-bound or not very mobile, you need to roll them and look at the back, look at their sacrum, look at their heels, look for any sort of skin infections. Number three, neurologic. Make sure you've done a quick neuro exam. Is this a TIA or a stroke or an intracranial hemorrhage or mass that's causing the altered mental status and now delirium? Number four, look for metabolic disorders, things like hyper or hypoglycemia, hyper or hyponatremia, hyperkalemia, or just dehydration and an acute kidney injury. Any of those metabolic disorders can trigger delirium. Fifth, think about cardiopulmonary. Are they weak and dizzy because they're actually having an acute coronary syndrome or a dissection? Are they hypoxic? Are they hypotensive? Make sure you've got a good set of vital signs. Number six, any sort of toxicity or withdrawal. We may not think to ask about alcohol or substance use in our older patients. Or maybe it's not an intentional use of alcohol or substances. Maybe it's a therapeutic misadventure. They were taking acetaminophen or salicylates for their joint pain, and they didn't realize they were taking more than they should, and now they've developed delirium. And finally, any other causes, things like pain, or even urinary or fecal retention, or some sort of pain from unidentified trauma, environmental changes even. For example, if they have a hearing aid at home or a vision aid at home, and now they're in your ED, and they don't have those things, that can cause delirium. So look for and assess for the common causes of delirium. One, medications. Two, infections. Three, neurologic. Four, metabolic disorders. Five, cardiopulmonary. And six, toxicity or withdrawal or therapeutic misadventures with polypharmacy. And then seven, pain or any other environmental changes. Now, you don't have to remember that long list, but if you look and identify your patients with delirium and at least Do a quick med reconciliation, ask about their meds, and then if you're doing some routine screening with your physical exam or a CBC and a general chemistry panel, you'll cover most of those things in an EKG if there's any signs or symptoms of possible cardiac events. Now you know how to assess, diagnose, and evaluate patients who may have delirium. Next time, I'll talk about prevention and treatment. And now a word from our sponsor, Metricade, the experts on scheduling systems. Metricaid system is partially tech and partially a professional service. The web-based tool allows me to let Metricade know exactly how I want to be scheduled. The technology and the expert schedulers work together to produce a schedule that somehow meets the needs of the department, filling every shift while still letting me work more of the shifts I want and fewer of the shifts I don't. When you have a problem, there's an expert scheduler answering the phone who probably fills 2,000 to 4,000 ED shifts a month. They know all the intricacies of ED scheduling. This is not an automated push-button schedule. The technology is a tool to help an expert build a schedule to suit your needs exactly. Go see for yourself at metricade.com slash emcases. And now for the best of University of Toronto Emergency Medicine. 
Now, I know this is EM quick hits, and the hits are supposed to be quick, but when the Dose VF trial got published this month and I got to chatting with the lead author and EM cases Rohit Mohindra, we ended up delving into some shocking territory that I just had to keep in the segment. So apologies in advance. This quick hit is not very quick, but it's worth it. Okay. Our best chance to save the life of a patient in cardiac arrest is if they're in VF or pulses VTAC, way better than PEA or asystole. So when a trial comes out showing an impressive benefit for a relatively simple intervention in these patients, we pay close attention. Today, we're going to dive and explore the deep waters of the DOSE VF trial from the New England Journal of Medicine published in November 2022. And who better to talk about this landmark trial than the lead author, Dr. Sheldon Cheskis, and SREMI researcher and North York General EM doc, EBM Critical Appraiser Master, who you've heard before on our Journal Jam podcast and on EM Quick Hits, Dr. Rohit Mohindra. Now, before we put on our oxygen tanks for this deep dive, we need to declare how exactly the two of you were involved in the study so that our biases are laid out nice and clearly. Dr. Cheskis, uh, welcome back on EM Cases. Can you just tell us about how you're actually involved in the study beside being the lead author? No, for sure. Thanks so much for having me, Anton. Always a pleasure uh, to be on EM Cases. And yes, I was the principal investigator of the study. I was the one who developed the idea, and I was the one who led the research into the area of refractory VF and the use of double sequential or vector change defibrillation. So yeah, I'd say that's probably the pretty big conflict. <laughs> All right. <yeah. laughs> okay. So as long as everyone understands that from the outset, that uh, it was your idea, you're the primary investigator, and so we need to see it from that perspective. And uh, Dr. Mohendra, how were you involved in the study? Hi, Anton. Yeah, thanks for having me. So I was involved as one of the site collaborators. Uh, so our hospital was one of the sites that patients who received the treatments came to. And so we helped with uh, following up with the patients. So I'm listed as one of the site collaborator authors on the study. All right. So I've already said why treatment of VF and pulses VT are important, but more specific to this study, why is treatment of refractory VF so important? Dr. Mohendra? Yeah, well, like you mentioned, Anton, the best outcomes we have in cardiac arrest is when we have a rhythm that we can shock. But we also know that treatment refractory VF can be present in up to half the patients who are in cardiac arrest. And as you've discussed before, we have pretty limited options for it. The drugs that we have don't really have a significant advantage uh, in getting these patients back. We also think about the fact that ventricular fibrillation evolves with time. The underlying pathophysiology changes as more times pass. So after three shocks, we start to wonder, is there a better way for us to get these patients back? Let's talk a little bit about the rationale of the study. We know that time is heart and brain. Can you tell us a little bit more about the rationale behind vector change and dual sequence defib? So these two terms that people throw around, what exactly are they? And what was the rationale behind it? What were you thinking, Dr. Cheskis? So when patients present in VF, actually the first three shocks, their survival is not bad with standard AL defibrillation. So one shock, you can have a 60% survival. Two shocks can be 40%. The sum of the first three shocks, you generally get a survival rate of about 30%. What happens though, when you go to shocks four to 10, or these refractory cases, survival drops to about 12.5%. And that's reflected in a huge Swedish registry that looked at this particular question. And it matches our registry work as well, that survival after three shocks really drops off. So one needs to start thinking, are there alternative strategies that we can use in refractory VF to improve survival? So two of the concepts that we thought about was a concept of vector change, so changing the pads from the classic AL position to the AP position, and the second one being double sequential external defibrillation, the application of a second defibrillator with pads in the AP position in sequentially shocking through the use of two defibrillators. Sorry, just, just to clarify there, so AL you mean anterior lateral, and AP you mean anterior posterior. Okay, I just want to clarify that for listeners. Correct. And so 
you know, these strategies have been thought about in the past as, as potential mechanisms in terms of improving uh, survival from refractory VF, but there's never been a randomized controlled trial in the past to actually look at this question. A lot of observational studies, case series, but all of them have faults in relationship to the fact that most of the time these studies looked at this as a last second or a last ditched effort after everything fails. And I can tell you in VF, if you wait to the last ditch, you you get last ditch results. No one survives. So if you looked at ECMO after seven or eight shocks, no one would survive. And that, those are the things that we want to do. We wanted to protocolize a change in care early as an intervention. That's what we looked at in this study. All right. So that's a bit about the rationale. All makes sense to me. How did you then go on to design the study considering that rationale that you just explained? Yeah. So what we did was we wanted to really focus on the concept of vector and the concept of energy. Because if either of these two strategies worked, we wanted to understand perhaps the biological plausibility of why they worked. So we basically took patients who presented in VF for pulseless VT, they would receive standard ALS therapy if available, and they had a minimum of three successive shocks given. So these patients had to be VF, 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 and still in VF at the fourth analysis. So previously, other studies, they said three shocks. We made sure these were three successive shocks, each separated by two minutes of CPR. At the fourth analysis, patient was still in VF. That was our inclusion criteria. After the third shock, the patients were randomized through a cluster randomization process to one of three strategies. One was to continue to shock the patient in a standard AL position, as they were for the first three shocks. The second was to switch the pads from AL to AP, otherwise known as vector change defibrillation. And the third strategy was to move to the double sequential external defibrillation strategy by adding a second defibrillator with pads uh, in the AP position. So what we were able to do, therefore, is protocolize early use of an intervention as opposed to doing it as a last-ditch effort. We felt that was going to be critical if we were going to see success in any of these interventions. All right. So that's a bit about the design. I want to know a few more details there. So first of all, the exclusion criteria. Let's start with that. Which patients were not enrolled in this study? Patients under the age of 18, DNRs, traumatic arrest, drowning, the usual exclusion criteria that you see in most of the cardiac arrest studies. All right. Excellent description of the study. I have a good idea now who was excluded, what you did to them, why you did it to them. Let's talk a little bit about bystander CPR. This is a bit of a side trip here. My understanding is that 68% of arrests were witnessed and 58% received bystander CPR. And I kind of feel like I need to plug here a little bit to improve public education on how to do chest compressions and more access to defibrillators because we'd probably save a heck of a lot more lives if we did bystander CPR 100% of the time that there's a witness arrest. Yeah, so for me, listen, I, you know, I've been doing this resuscitation work in Toronto for a long time. Our bystander CPR rates in this particular trial were phenomenal, and it shows that a huge improvement in bystander CPR in Toronto and southern Ontario in general. We've seen this trend. I think when you look at the demographic characteristics of the population, um, the bystander CPR, bystander witness rates were higher than we usually see, as were cardiac arrest in public location. More importantly, though, and I think the thing that's striking is 84% of the people who were enrolled in the study were males. So this is refractory VF is much, much more common in our population in males than it is in females. And there's good reason for that. Uh, with males, you have a larger chest cavity. There's a greater transthoracic impedance. And therefore, the impact of defibrillation, if it's not successful, is more likely related to that transthoracic impedance. If you think of comorbidities, there's more people have refractory VF. They have LVH, they have cardiomyopathies, they have disorders in which the classic defibrillation may not be quite as effective in patients who have, quote unquote, normal cardiac uh, structure, normal hearts. So I think there's good reason why uh, patients who have refractive EF may be much more difficult to defibrillate. Wow. I'm glad I took that side trip. That was really interesting. <laughs> All right, let's, let's get back to the nuts and bolts of the study. So the study enrolled 405 patients, and my understanding is that the intent was to roll 930 patients. 
what happened there? I mean, it always raises eyebrows when enrollment is stopped early because if you want, you know, because, you know, you might wonder about the study being underpowered and you might wonder it was stopped early for reasons that might bias the results. Uh, So why was the study stopped early? Why 405 instead of 930 patients? Yeah, so, so that's a very easy question, actually. The study was stopped early because of COVID. So you have to understand, Anton, we did this study for 18 months with COVID, okay? Our paramedic services. Most studies around the world, they would have stopped long before that, and many were stopped for COVID. At the time that we actually stopped this study, with our paramedics working 18 months during COVID, we had a workforce about 75% of the normal workforce. Of those 75%, 90% were stuck in offload delay. So what happened theoretically at this point in the study was patients who were randomized to double sequential, by the time paramedics got to the scene, the patients were on their fourth or fifth or sixth shock by the fire services. So in fact, the whole premise of the study, i.e. early intervention, was completely destroyed. And therefore, what we were facing at this point in the study was we were actually comparing standard to standard because no intervention shock could be given. So it's important to understand this study was not stopped because it was a positive study. No one knew what the study result were. They were stopped because of feasibility. And I think that's really important. So this was not stopped because of superiority. It was stopped because of feasibility. The other thing I think that's important when you talk power, you have to be careful with the term power. You're only underpowered if your intervention effect size is small. The intervention effect size here was massive. So this study was not underpowered because of the massive effect size. So I think whenever someone says underpowered, when you have a massive effect size, you need to be careful. Classically, studies are underpowered because they don't enroll enough patients. Here, yes, we did not enroll as many as we thought we were for the reasons I just explained, but the intervention effect size was massive. When you stop early, there still is always the risk that the true effect size is an unknown because you stopped randomly at a point in the study where the effect size is, is much more exaggerated or less exaggerated than it would be in real life. And there's always a risk at this point that we just stopped it randomly at a point where either the study results really look good or they could have been actually a lot better. So all it really means is that the results are, are great and they're promising, but we have to we have to think a little bit carefully about how good is it? And, and the answer is probably from, from this study, we can't say for sure we know, but we can certainly say that the results were quite impressive um, based on where we stopped and the reasons that we stopped from. Yeah, so I think Rohit makes a fantastic point. I think to counter that point, we looked for an interaction between time of the study and the, and the end of the study. So as you can see, we had a pilot study that was part of this. We had a pre-COVID aspect, and we had a COVID part of the study. So all those three phases, the point estimates were exactly the same. It didn't shift at all through any of the phases of the study. As well, when you look at the study results with respect to double sequential, the findings were consistent amongst multiple sensitivity analysis, making it much stronger with respect to the study findings than, per se, the vector change findings, which weren't as consistent amongst some of the sensitivity analysis. So I totally agree with Rohit. Anytime you stop, there's always a potential for exaggeration of the, of the, of the effect size. But I think here, given the consistency across multiple portions of the study, we, we would we would tend to suggest that the study's findings are in fact real as opposed to spurious. All right, we've we've mentioned the results of the study multiple times, but we actually haven't told anyone what the results were. <laughs> so, Dr. Mahendra, let's dig into the results or the outcomes of the study. What were the primary and secondary outcomes, and uh, why did they choose those outcomes? Yeah, Anton. So, their their primary outcome was survival to discharge. Some of the secondary outcomes were quite important as well. I think the uh, termination of ventricular fibrillation and getting an organized rhythm and a pulse or blood pressure were important ones because they really help us understand that it's the defibrillation that's making the difference in these patients. Um, and they also looked at neurological function and discharge, um, which they uh, measured using a modified Rankine scale of less than or equal to two. All right. So great primary outcome. Uh, you can't really argue with 
dead or alive. <laughs> so that's uh, that's a great outcome. And the secondary outcomes, um, I just wanted to drill into a little bit the the modified Rankin scale because we've talked on EM cases before about how the modified Rankin scale is highly subject to bias for stroke patients, for example, and so many of the stroke trials have the modified Rankin scale as their primary outcome. And that's why it's very easy to knock those studies. Dr. Cheskis, any insight into the difficulties associated with the modified Rankin scale? Um, I imagine there's just not much else to use. And Well, I think the question we make more commonly get actually is why we chose the modified Rankin scale score of two as opposed to three. A lot of cardiac arrest studies use a modified Rankin scale score of three to show a lack of significant neurological disability at discharge. We wanted to make it as minimal as possible because we felt that a modified Rankin scale score of three actually did have disability. So that's why we used two. The other option would be to use CPC score, uh, but we, we just chose the modified Rankin scale because many of the previous rock studies that we had taken part in also use that modified Rankin scale score. Yes, it is subjective. I think the more important portion in our study in terms of that score is that the the people who are assessing for modified rank and score were completely blinded to the intervention received by the patient. So there's, there can't be a bias if you're blinded to that. We couldn't blind the paramedics with respect to the intervention because clearly hard to blind double sequential, but blinding the, blinding the reviewers actually, I think maybe perhaps takes a little bit of that bias out of that. All right. Yeah. It sounds like you did pretty much everything you can to try and minimize the bias. So that sounds great. Um, I want to talk about what everyone's been waiting for now, and that is the actual results. So- Hit us with the results, Dr. Cheskis. Well, I think for the primary outcome, and I think it's important, the raw results showed that double sequential had a survival rate of 30.4%, uh, 21.7% for the vector change arm, and 13.3% in the standard arm. So clearly huge absolute differences. But it's very important in a cluster randomized trial Really, unadjusted results really mean nothing. The adjusted results are much more important. And in the adjusted results, double sequential was superior to standard defibrillation for all primary and secondary outcomes. And vector change was superior to standard defibrillation for VF termination in survival to hospital discharge, but not neurologically intact survival. Okay, so just to review there, Survival was 30% with double sequential, 22% with vector change, and 13% with standard care. When you did the adjusted analysis, it looks like double sequential was a bit better than vector change in terms of the functional outcome. Is that correct? Yeah. I'm always a bit careful with respect to... uh, Remember, the study wasn't meant to compare double sequential to vector at any time. So these are all being compared to standard defibrillation. What we can say is double sequential results were significant for neurologically intact survival, whereas vector changes results were not. Got it. So if you had to choose between doing double sequential and vector change, you'd probably choose double sequential? So all things being equal, there's there's no question we would choose double sequential. And, and this is when I talked about some of the other sensitivity analysis, et cetera. But we must remember that vector change was superior for survival. So I think there are certain situations where vector change to me makes a lot of sense. I think that's the, the beauty of the study's results. There's just going to be jurisdictions where you're not going to be able to have two defibrillators, rural communities. There's some services that don't double dispatch to cardiac arrest. So only one defibrillator may be available. In those situations, I'd use vector change as opposed to continue standard AL defibrillation until a second defibrillator became available. If two defibrillators are available right at right off the start, then I would, based on these study findings, I would definitely do double sequential first. It's also helpful for places that are not comfortable using double sequential. It does take a bit of training um, to do it safely without uh, hurting people or, or damaging your devices. So it does give you kind of that nice other option if you have a refractory VF and you're looking for treatment options. That segues nicely into talking about defibrillator damage. Uh, you know, one of the concerns about dual defib is that we could blow it a defibrillator. Why in this study were no defibrillators damage. You know, should we be concerned about damaging defibrillators if we decide to do dual sequence defibrillation, Dr. Dr. Cheskis? 
Yeah, so I think this this whole issue of defibrillator damage is incredibly overstated. Um, we never damage a defibrillator at any time in our study. The one case where defibrillator was damaged that people talk about is a case of synchronized cardioversion of pulseless VT through the use of two defibrillators. So in theory, if you press the buttons of the defibrillator simultaneously, not sequentially, and get it to the millisecond, there's a potential risk for damage. Having said that, and Paul Dorian and I have worked on this for a long time prior to the study, when you do sequential defibrillation, so one button is pressed on one defibrillator, one on the other, and in our study, we've done this, and this will be part of our secondary evaluation or secondary analyses of these papers, the timing for that was about 500 milliseconds. There is no potential EPS explanation to damage a defibrillator at 500 milliseconds. And as such, if you do sequential defibrillation, we feel there is zero risk of defibrillator damage. Even if there was a risk of defibrillator damage, you could argue that if you're saving a life, it's probably worth the cost of one defibrillator. Let's move on to some critical appraisal stuff. Uh, We've already talked about stopping the study early, uh, but there's some other things I'd like to chat about. You know, the results were certainly impressive with meaningful outcomes. Dr. Mohendra, can you start us off in terms of any thoughts on critical appraisal? Yeah, I agree with like Dr. Cheskis. This is an impressive study and my congratulations to you and the team for doing such a great job. I think there are some things with any study that we just have to talk about so that you're aware of the limitations um, if you're going to use this in your practice. Dr. Cheskis alluded to this earlier about vector change treatment. Um, As he mentioned, the sensitivity analysis showed that the effect size that we're reporting in this study is probably not reflective of what the true effect size is based on that analysis. They also did have a higher rate of crossover um, in patients back to standard treatment, so back to the AP position of the pads. So that, that probably would bias the results a little bit to say that we don't really know what the true effect size is. I think another important thing is that um, all studies that uh, sort of show a new technique and a new treatment, we always have to be a little bit cautious about them because they tend to show higher benefits than the subsequent studies. And I think the biggest challenge moving forward with with dual sequential defibrillation is that it's going to become much more common and it's going to be harder now to tease out the effect of whether it's better CPR, um, if it's better use of vector change, or if it's better use of dual sequential that's leading to these improvement in results. Yeah, Rohit, listen, makes fantastic points. And we, as someone who's incredibly anal about CPR quality, if you look at our tables, you'll notice that regardless of the intervention that the paramedics were providing, vector double sequential, all CPR quality was guideline compliant, regardless of the arm. So that's never been shown in any of these previous observational studies, but we showed CPR quality was superb no matter which arm you got. So I think that's critical. And I think Rohit is actually correct. You may do you may have an intervention that fails, not because of the intervention, but because the preceding CPR quality was so bad, nothing was going to survive. Was going to help the survival of the patient. So we spent a lot of time in this trial on the choreography of the trial, how to actually do double sequential, how to do it consistently while maintaining high quality CPR. So if you don't focus on all those pieces, Rohan's exactly right. You may not get the same results. So I think it, it's it's a number of factors that I think have led to the results that we really focused hard on in this trial. Yeah, I mean, that brings up the importance of good training. So, and as you alluded to, Dr. Mohendra, double sequential defibrillation requires specific training. Um, and I would think that before this becomes kind of new standard practice, it'll be important to incorporate this into ACLS courses and to have hospitals training all their nurses, eMERGE docs, RTs, paramedics, everyone should be trained properly on this because if in the study they were trained very well, we should really all be trained as well as they were in the study to expect those outcomes. We could get into a whole discussion about uh, cardiac arrest centers, but I'll leave that for a later podcast with with Weingart or something. (laughs) All right. (laughs) Let's continue with our uh, critical appraisal here and uh, talk about blinding. Um, Now, of course, it's kind of impossible to blind paramedics to 
dual sequence. How do you think the lack of blinding of the different uh, arms of this study um, affected the outcomes potentially? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a good point, Anton. And I think that they looked at the CPR quality across all three arms and the CPR quality was quite good uh, and seemed to be equivalent. So, you know, some people have mentioned the fact that if you were biased a bit towards one particular treatment, you might provide better CPR or better ALS. But from the results we have, that doesn't really seem to come across. And the other thing to remember is that all the outcomes, except for the uh, modified Rankin scale, are quite objective. And we're all done by uh, blinded data assessors, myself included. So I think that they've done the best they can in a treatment that just isn't possible to be blinded for to make sure that things are equivalent across the three arms. Yeah. If I had a cardiac arrest, I wouldn't want paramedics to put on blindfolds when they're defibrillating me. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think Oroha did a great job in doing that. I think so. When you look at the data... And when you look at the outcomes, when you look at the demographic characteristics, they're very similar across all the fields. When you look at CPR quality, they're very similar across all the all the three intervention arms. When you look at amount of antiarrhythmic given, epinephrine given, time to epinephrine, time to antiarrhythmic, they are very balanced across the arms. And one thing that people mentioned in their analysis, well, what about in-hospital care? And the issue was we actually because of the timelines for the New England Journal publication, we couldn't actually get that data together in a time frame quick enough. So people were thinking, well, maybe Angio and PCI were given a different rate amongst the three arms. And in fact, when we looked at our data, and I've presented this subsequently, the rates of angiography, the rates of PCI were almost exactly the same across all three arms. So there's no difference in that particular level of care as well. So again, that goes to the issue of consistency, which you would expect in a class to randomize controlled trial. All right. So as much as you could, the patients were very well balanced. Um, it was interesting what you were saying about male patients. So it would have been nice to see some more female patients in there, but that's just the nature of ventricular fibrillation, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Let's kind of cut to the chase for the practical application in our practice, in our actual practices in the emergency department from this study. Dr. Mahindra, is dual sequence defib ready for prime time? Yeah, it's on. It's a great question, and I think it is. Um, as we mentioned in the introduction, refractory VF uh, is a difficult thing to treat. Uh, we don't really have uh, good drugs or other treatments for it. Um, And if you're going down your pathway and you've gotten to three shocks and you still have VF, I think this would be a very, very reasonable thing to try. And in places where it may not be feasible, whether you don't have access to a second defibrillator or you don't feel comfortable doing it or uh, your sort of policies prevent you from doing it, I think just going for a vector change. So putting on a second pair of pads and connecting your defibrillator to that second pair of pads would be a really useful thing to sort of do as a next step. Yeah, I want to highlight a detail that you just said there, putting on a second set of pads rather than pulling the pads off and changing them, because I've seen people do that too. And it will take at least, I don't know, 15 seconds to actually change those pads uh, rather than just throwing on a second set of pads. And of course, time is heart and brain. So that's an important detail for sure. Yeah. So Rohit, that was, you know, excellently said. I, I, I Listen, we've got this question plenty of times in terms of is double sequential ready for prime time? And I think at the end of the day, the guideline bodies will give, they will weigh in. So ILCOR will weigh in, AHA will work in, weigh in, ERC will work in. And whenever I think of, of guidelines, I think of science. And my mentor, Lori Morrison, told me, and I mentioned this at the AHA when I gave this talk, she said, Sean, when you do a trial, You do your best science you can and let that science stand for itself. And I think in this trial, we provided the best science. And there's no question in the area of double sequential, you can't compare this science to anything else out there right now. So when we think about people doing this, during the time of the trial, I must have had 75 services at least call me on how to do double sequential. They were already doing it but they wanted to do it better. So people were doing this already without really good science. At least now they have some good science to go on. 
when I think about ED or hospital use or ICUs, I think Rowett was bang on. But the caveat I would have is that if someone comes in from the field and hasn't had double sequential, has had six or seven shocks, the likelihood of success in eMERGE is very low. Where the likelihood of success in hospital is, is for the witnessed arrest. So the witnessed in hospital arrest, if you've had three shocks, that's a perfect situation to look at using an alternative strategy. But if it's someone who's coming in from the field, I wouldn't expect miracles if they've already been shocked six or seven times. So I think that's a little bit of a caveat of the ED use of double sequential. It's a really good point, Dr. Cheskis. It's it's remembering that the study is useful if you use it in the way that it was designed to be used. And we see this indication creep with a lot of things that end up with research. So it's really important to use it in that patient where you're at that. You've finished that third shock and you're not getting the patient back. But you're absolutely right. In the patient who's had multiple shocks outside of the eMERGE or even in the eMERGE, this is not the right patient to benefit from this treatment. All right. Yeah. I have to admit for my practice, I was one of those people who was already using dual sequential after three shocks, uh, and I'm going to continue using it based on the science now. The big question that I ask myself now when I'm doing dual sequence, um, and I'm lucky enough to have two defibrillators where I work, is why not do dual sequence right off the bat? Instead of doing three shocks, three single standard shocks, why not just start at the beginning for the first shock and the second shock and the third shock? I mean, these, of, of course, these would be, you know, in emergency department arrests in, in my case, but even in the field, why not just start with dual sequence right off the bat if you can? Dr. Cheskis, I mean, I know your study didn't look at that in particular, but what would your guess or thoughts about that be? So my God, my thoughts are I'm actually going to play the devil's advocate. I would not do it after the first shock, and I'll tell you why. First of all, double sequential takes a sequence of events to actually get the pads on. Second of all, when you look at survival from cardiac arrest and VF after one shock, it's pretty good. It's 60%. If you look after two shocks, you're up at 40%. Three shocks, as I mentioned earlier, is about 30%. So if I was going to design a trial to show superiority of double sequential to standard after one shock, I'm going to have to get a survival rate greater than 60%. That you would have to have a massive sample size to prove that that was actually capable of happening. It might be, but it's a big difference from setting up a sample size for a study at 12.7, 12% survival versus 60% survival. So my own feeling is that standard AL defibrillation is likely okay for the first three shocks. But if you haven't terminated VF and gotten ROSC there, then I think you need to look at these alternative strategies. And the right answer may not be double sequential. You may be in a system that does goes to ECMO early. And that's another great strategy because the population of the arrest trial and our trial are almost exactly the same. But many people are not going to have that type of ECMO system in place in their system. For those, I think double sequential and vector change are, uh, are an excellent option based on our study's findings. Yeah, I think it's important to remember, too, a little bit about the pathophysiology of what we think is happening in ventricular fibrillation. And certainly earlier on, it's a more organized kind of rhythm and electrical process. And as it evolves over time, we know it becomes much more chaotic and complex so there is sort of a pathophysiological reason to expect it to work early. And then as you sort of go down longer in time, um, this trying the different vectors or sequential defibrillation makes more sense from a physiological point of view as well. Got it. That's a great answer. We've been talking only about shocking VF and pulses VTAC patients, but of course, it's important not to forget the other stuff for refractory VF. There's ongoing continuous chest compressions whenever possible. Uh, there's stopping the epinephrine, which, you know, sometimes I see, you know, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve 10, 12 doses of epinephrine given. I think now it's pretty much agreed upon that after two or three doses of epinephrine, you should stop the epinephrine for patients in VF. There's amiodarone, of course, 300 milligrams, which is part of the ACLS guidelines. And then there's the stuff that isn't in the ACLS algorithms that we've talked about on EM cases before. Other things to try uh, when you're kind of throwing the typewriter at the patient. There's esmolol, there's stellate ganglion block, which I was joking about at the top of the podcast. Uh, 
And while the evidence isn't robust for Esmolol, for example, if you are in a situation where you've exhausted all your options and you're compelled to keep the resuscitation going for whatever reason, just remember that Esmolol 500 micrograms per kilogram is a reasonable option. So that would be 35 milligrams in a 70 kilogram adult or 50 milligrams in a 100 kilogram adult. You can check the best case ever 73 for more on Esmolol in VF. And in other exciting news, Dr. Mohindra is launching a brand new FOMED offering on EM cases called Journal Club. So everything that's boring about journal clubs is completely removed from EM cases journal club. (laughs) And it's a short, concise, accurate to the point email blast that you can sign up for through the subscription button on the EM Cases website. And uh, just like the Q&A Pro of the week, you'll keep up to date on the latest and greatest studies in EM with free one-minute reads delivered straight into your inbox. And we promise uh, you won't be inundated with emails. It'll just be one email per month. For those of you interested in a bit deeper dive than the EM Cases Journal Club email blast will also have the EM Cases Journal Club posted as a blog on the EM Cases website with a short peer review and critical appraisal of the Journal Club by Master Clinical Epidemiologist Shelley McLeod of SREMI, who just happens to be Dr. Cheskis's partner. So thank you so much, gentlemen, for your time and your expertise, and best of luck with your next cardiac arrest patient. Thanks for having me, Anton. Anton, thanks so much, always, for having me. Just a pleasure, and I hope we gave some great information to your listeners today. Last but not least, here's EM Cases' Noor Khatib, who usually hosts our Rural EM Cases Quick Hit series, but this time she's switching gears a bit to an under-recognized emergency across all jurisdictions and offers some solutions on how we can do better. You walk into your overnight shift to a busy emergency department. Of course it's busy. When is it not? All you can do is take it one patient at a time. Your first patient is a young woman with a Coley's fracture who states she was very clumsy and fell down the stairs. You note she had several fractures over the last few years. Your next patient is a regular to your ED presenting again with a chronic headache. You provide them with the migraine cocktail and all is well. The third patient is an older, disheveled, bruised man with alcohol use disorder. You got this. You've trained for all of this. Now, what if I told you that all three have faced intimate partner violence, or IPV, and the emergency department is the only safe space they felt they could go? November is Domestic Violence Awareness Month, and I've invited Dr. Carrie Samsell, my co-author on a CGEM publication of the CAPE Position Statement on Intimate Partner Violence in the ED. Carrie is a medical director of the Sexual Assault and Partner Abuse Care Program in Ottawa and has been a longtime advocate for this vulnerable population within our EDs. We will be discussing our IPV in the ED guidelines, and I'd like to remind you of the EM Cases Episode 65 on Intimate Partner Violence from January 2018. Welcome, Carrie. Wonderful to have you on. Thank you, Noor. Happy to be here discussing this important work. It's important to revisit IPV as a topic, as when that Best Case Ever podcast was recorded in 2018, A woman was murdered in Canada every six days. And while that's very shocking, it's gotten significantly worse to every 36 hours since 2021. Many other specialties have position statements around intimate partner violence, but the Canadian emergency doctors, i.e. the physicians who see these patients the most, did not have one. So So we we decided decided to to write one. IPV transcends socioeconomic classes, ethnicities, gender, and sexual orientation, as well as physical borders. The World Health Organization estimates the prevalence to be one in three women worldwide, with no significant difference between continents. Women exposed to IPV are twice more likely to suffer from depression and alcohol use disorders, as well as 38% of all murders of women worldwide are IPV related. That's shocking. 38% of murders of all women worldwide are IPV related. That's an incredible number. Now, the stereotypical battered woman is often the only image that comes to mind when thinking of IPV, when it can encompass actually lots of things like stalking, threats to take away children, workplace sabotage, or blackmail. Think of IPV in multiple visits for the same presentation, chronic pain syndromes, mental health concerns, and substance use in addition to our trauma population. 
The ED is the one place where these patients are seen and we miss them because we aren't trained to look at this. A Justice Canada study estimated that patients are three times more likely to visit the eMERGE than their own family doctor for IPV-related health concerns. A 2008 study found 44% of women murdered by their intimate partner had visited the eMERGE in the last year. Now just imagine if we were able to pick that up. 93% of these victims visited the eMERGE specifically for IPV-related injury. ED physicians unfortunately only identified 5% of IPV cases. Only 13% asked about domestic violence, despite almost 40% of females presenting with violence-related injuries. Like many things, the COVID-19 pandemic has worsened the prevalence of IPV with shelter-at-home orders, resulting in increased calls to police as well as community supports, as well as decreased recognized presentations in the ED. So we bring to you a summary of our recommendations. Number one. IPV should be recognized as having similar presentations as non-accidental traumas or child abuse. We all know what signs of non-accidental traumas are and child abuse. We learned about them in medical school. Delayed presentation, multiple injuries in various stages of healing, certain burns, pattern of injury that is inconsistent with the provided story. So why don't we recognize it when it comes to intimate partner violence? Number two, IPV should be considered in patients presenting multiple times for the same complaint chronic pain syndromes, mental health concerns, and substance use disorders. There is significant overlap between these issues and IPV, both as a risk factor for the abuse, as well as a reaction to the abuse itself. Number three, universal screening is encouraged in the emergency department. The idea that there is no evidence for screening is based on literature that never studied intervention. And by universal, we mean everyone who is capable of answering the questions. If you limit your screening to a single gender or age group, you will miss a proportion of these vulnerable patients. There are multiple screening tools available, most of which are two to three questions long and include questions like, have you been hit, kicked, slapped, punched, or otherwise hurt by someone in the past year? Do you feel safe in your current relationship? Is there a partner from a previous relationship who is making you feel unsafe now? Recommendation four. We recommend treating IPV-related injuries in the same manner as we do any accidental trauma. We know how to take care of these patients, so you can provide the same quality care to someone who has experienced violence from intimate partner violence as someone who's experienced violence from other traumas. Recommendation 5. Referral of all consenting patients to a specialized IPV treatment center is recommended, as their complex care is difficult to achieve in a busy emergency department. Emergency departments are always overloaded, always overcrowded. So it's very difficult to take in all of the information that is needed to take care for these patients. If you practice in Ontario, the Ontario Network of Sexual Assault and Domestic Violence Treatment Centers are affiliated with every emergency department. Check out their website in the show notes to find the center nearest you. Outside of Ontario, The International Association of Forensic Nurses maintains a list of affiliated programs that is searchable on their website. Finally, in this instance, Google is your friend. Search IPV treatment centers and your location to find a program near you. Number six, in documenting IPV-related charts, avoid legal words and use clear and factual statements. Always assume your chart is going to be taken to court. Using words like patient states and patient reports remains factual and non-judgmental. Do not use words like claims or alleges as they imply skepticism and are legal terms that should not be used. Number seven, your final diagnosis should contain IPV to capture accurate data for the population prevalence in your area. This also has important funding implications for those specialized treatment programs that you are referring your patient to. And there you have it, our seven recommendations as part of the CAPE position statement on intimate partner violence in the emergency department. IPV is a serious, common, preventable public health problem that is likely to be in your emergency department today. You can save a life with a few simple questions and a system with ever-increasing strains and ever-decreasing resources. This intervention is free, saves lives, and research has shown it is welcomed by patients. All right. Hope you all learned a little something about IPV, dual sequence defibrillation, fluids for pancreatitis, workup and management of nasal fractures, and picking up delirium in the ED. 
Tickets are on sale for EM Cases Summit, and 200 of your colleagues have already bought tickets since they went on sale just a couple of weeks ago, and the simulation sessions and morning symposiums are almost sold out. So please head on over to emcasesummit.com and get your tickets. It can be your way of supporting all the free open access medical education that EM Cases has provided you over the years and ensure that we keep on providing it free into the future. So until next time, take it easy. Take it easy.